this is a series called Ecologues. Um, this is the second of six meetings. And Ecologues is part of a larger initiative called the Writings on the Wall, uh, which is an Erasmus Plus funded project uh, that New Coder is in partnership with, um, is presenting in partnership with the Climate Academy in Brussels. And the project really aims at helping young people combat the climate crisis through journalism, activism, and art. And News Decoder, our side, we bring in the journalism piece of that. We are a global news service for young people based here in Paris and working with schools all around the world, um, training young people, students, in the tools and techniques of journalism as a way of investigating, examining big global issues, climate change, chief among them, um, as we see often with our students. And the project was born out of looking for new ways to teach about climate education that go beyond very sort of surface level of service and really spotlight the change makers and um, the inspire real systems level change. Um, and the Climate Academy um, is featured in our first ecologue, which is available online if you want to catch up on what we've covered thus far. Um, and the project involves uh, lesson plans, climate science tutorials, journalism tutorials on environmental reporting, coder articles, and this series, which is our public forum, bringing together not just youth voices, but really the general public. And so we thank you all for being here and joining this conversation with us. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled to partner with the American Library to be able to host this both in person and online. Um, and as, as Alice mentioned, the, the topics of Ecologues are quite broad, and we do that on purpose so that we can play into the expertise of our wonderful speakers. And tonight we are joined by three um, brilliant speakers to help us tackle this somewhat enormous topic of environmental justice. And so here in person, we have Marie Kowe, um, who's a climate and social justice activist with Alternative of Paris. We have Florian Marie, um, a climate educator and advocate who's currently working with the Office of Climate Education um, at UNESCO. And then joining us up above here on the screen, um, we have uh, virtually from Switzerland, Paul Spencer Kowachewski, um, writer, coach, conservationist, um, and also a correspondent with News Decoder, um, who published several of his articles. And now in the promotion for tonight's event, which hopefully got you all in, in the room, both in person and virtual, you know, we asked the question, if environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies, then there's much to do. Where to start? Um, that lengthy definition comes from um, the US uh, Environmental Protection Agency, but it really does for me all the work we're going to talk about today. So, based on our speaker's expertise, we're going to start with the frames of looking at environmental justice through education and advocacy, storytelling, philosophy, um, and action and activism. And we're gonna start first with education and, and coming to Florian. Um, so you've had quite a range of experiences. Um, oh, actually, before I do that, sorry, I'm gonna back up um, and just do a bit of housekeeping in that we're gonna have each of our speakers um, give a brief presentation of their work, of their actions they're doing, um, we'll have some questions among us, and then we will leave plenty of time for questions. So that's our, our format for the evening. Um, so then back to, to, to Florian. Um, as we said, you've had a, quite a range of experiences working in climate education, international relations, um, currently with the Office for Climate Education, which was founded in 2018 as an ambitious response to the global need for education around climate change. Um, and then in your presentation, you got lots of frameworks um, to help engage our thinking around environmental justice. So I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us more how we might understand some of these different perspectives and the solution at work. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I thank you, uh, the library and New Decoder for giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. And uh, first of all, a disclaimer, because uh, so about the historical context of uh, environmental justice, I won't talk much about it, but based on my experience, I think I will just explain the different bias that I will have in my presentation and the, the perspective that I want to keep on how finally um, uh, climate education can be a solution for uh, climate empowerment and climate justice. So from my academical background, so I'm um, 
more specialized in uh, political sciences. Uh, this is my uh, yeah, academical background. For my professional background, I should say more about uh, climate education. Uh, I work for the Young Reporters for the Environment, which is an NGO which also works uh, in uh, empowering students who wants to write about climate change, to go to their communities to report on climate. Um, and um, also more on an international perspective, uh, because I've worked in international relations and more especially in Africa. So most of the examples that I would take are based in Africa because currently at the Office for Climate Education. Uh, so we are an NGO based in Paris working internationally in climate education and I'm more working in a new project design for Africa uh, in three pilot countries. Um, so this is more in my, my background on that. And the first point that I wanted to address is that Environmental justice can be defined as uh, with several uh, perspectives. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so from a political perspective, we can define environmental justice as the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulation, and policies. Regarding an environmental perspective, it's also the right to a safe, healthy, productive, and sustainable environmental for all, which is also linked to physical con conditions. But also international perspective uh, in terms of women, racial, and ethnic minorities, which remain underrepresented in adaptation planning and decision making processes. So, this is the definition with the different perspective, but maybe the main definition that um, helped me to understand the processes and how I want to emphasize this presentation, which are the processes that leads to environmental injustice, uh, is the following. Um, so if you can just <laughs> um, yeah, um, and this is also how we work in climate education. Uh, environmental justice is ensuring that collectively and individually we have the ability to prepare for, respond to, and recover from climate change impacts and the policies to mitigate or adapt to them by considering existing vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities resources, and capabilities. And the first point I wanted to address was about how, and this is the, the scheme after, um, how in climate, so it comes from multidimensional inequalities, including in social economy genders that transform into vulnerabilities um, and leads to lack of knowledge, lack of political power, lack of resources. And in the case of climate alters, it um, fosters the intensity of direct and indirect impacts of climate change and greater loss that cause more vulnerability. So this is just the um, frames. And I think in my presentation, I will emphasize on vulnerability, lack of knowledge, and lack of political power. So the first vulnerability I wanted to emphasize, and most in the African context, is the vulnerability regarding gender and the gender perspective, which is uh, something that I work on. And uh, this is just an example of how these different schemes um, 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 contributes to the perpetration of um, climate injustice. So just to give you a bit of context about how climate can affect gender inequalities in Africa, and uh, just about the spatial vulnerabilities. First of all, women die more often due to the consequences of climate change. Uh, and a recent report from UNESCO and uh, uh, UN showed that uh, women are 14 um, 14 times more affected uh, on mortality than men uh, due to climate uh, change events, whether it be clouds or other types of extreme events. And why? Because there are lots of vulnerabilities. For example, if we take the example of water, uh, women uh, go more than are more responsible, for example, in uh, collecting water. Uh, a few examples here, women spend an average 16 million hours per day cumulated, dedicated to collecting water in Africa compared to only 4 million for men. So they are more responsible and in terms of their dry uh, seasons, for example, they are more likely to be affected to drop schools, uh, to not have the, the, the adequate, adequate uh, education. So this is one of the, the inequalities and vulnerabilities to them. The second one is also in case of uh, agricultural production. So in Africa, for example, they're responsible for more than 80% of the workforce in uh, agriculture but they are less than 2% owners of the land. So in case of also impacts in terms of agriculture, women are also more affected. They are going to suffer greater loss and even more in Africa where the share of uh, the workforce is mostly for women. And the last example that I wanted to <coughs> is uh, women and health. 
and uh, the, the consequences of uh, climate change, for example, heat waves have effects on uh, the very health of women who are more affected also by this, uh, this uh, crisis. So it was just to give you a type of how inequalities, vulnerability affects uh, and are more affected by climate change. But we can also take in terms of urban, rural, economic, and all these types of multi multidimensional inequalities uh, kind of accumulate. And this is also what I like about the slogan uh, I can breathe uh, from the George Floyd. I think it's also something that we can take in terms of rural, urban, uh, racial discrimination, racial uh, environmental injustice that we might talk a bit after. And why this uh, uh, this issue continues is also because those types of population are invisible in the public policies. And to come back in the, on the definition of having inclusivity in the, the how you create the law, how you create environmental justice and law, I just wanted to take the example of uh, COP um, because this is also a subject I've worked in my master thesis. And how work and uh, are they inclusive? And uh, with COP26, is it the least inclusive COP? Um, and uh, I just had some uh, yeah, some feature feature and um, figure of uh, political power because climate justice is also how you give political power within those uh, COPs. And we can see that COP26 has uh, hosted, uh, I think it was 27,000 NGOs. Um, uh, there was uh, the biggest event in terms of climate justice summit uh, with more than 200 uh, sessions that were held on the specific theme of climate justice. So we can, uh, I think it's uh, you know, the next, next slide, yeah, a few figures that you can take after, and that more than 195 countries actually signed the agreement of COP26. Co but when you go actually inside the COP and how law is made within, within, within those um, big institutions. There are lots of uh, inequality in terms of uh, space, for example. Uh, so basically in culture of the green zone, the blue zones, NGOs are only accredited within the green zones, for example, and how you bargain to go to the blue zone where you actually can have political impact. Um, so NGOs, um, in order to advocate, there is a lot of barriers. We need also in time, uh, to be only in uh, side events uh, compared to uh, the official agenda. So there are lots of barriers also to how we pay to go to the COP, and I think in terms of funding, this is really important. Um, so besides uh, being able to, to, to go to COP and uh, to do that, um, I finally wanted to emphasize on how education can provide actually political power, uh, leadership, and what can the solution of climate education uh, has to do with that and climate justice. And uh, I think there are four points that uh, can be emphasized on the power of climate education. And you can, uh, after, <laughs> yeah, I think the four or five points that I wanted to emphasize on what I see in my job and, <laughs> and working as a climate educator is how it reduces vulnerabilities, that is provides uh, knowledge, but also political power Developing, developing critical thinking, and finally engaging forward action. But one figure is that within the climate finance, only 0.03% of the climate finance is nowadays dedicated to climate uh, education, which is not a lot to do with, the, <laughs> with everything that we have to do for every generation that is basically living the consequences of climate change, and especially in Africa. So for the first point, reducing vulnerabilities, I just wanted to emphasize the result from the uh, reports that you can find uh, about the Foreign Ministry of UK uh, that had uh, uh, published a report on how uh, girls' education can actually reduce the vulnerability to climate change. And there are more than 40 million uh, children that are affected or cannot go to school because of uh, climate hazards, but also the crisis, the conflict due to climate uh, hazards with the lakes in Africa, so all the, those consequences. But pushing the effort of quality girls' education actually helps to reduce the vulnerabilities um, with knowledge uh, um, and how you can find a solution. Going into green jobs, uh, also this is something uh, how basic education has a direct impact. And this is how they also represent, uh, how it gives resilience, adaptation, adaptation, reflecting on mitigation uh, measures. So this is how 
education reduce vulnerabilities, but how climate change can also uh, provide knowledge. Uh, and this is really important, uh, how uh, it can yeah, provide knowledge to all schools, but there are also some barriers to that. And uh, a recent report from UNESCO has highlighted how climate education is actually not in school yet or uh, to a small scale. scale. And I think it's only um, uh, less than 20 or 30 percent of climate of uh, uh, national curricula, school curricula, actually integrate climate change or environmental uh, topics within their curricula, or at a really low level. And there's lots of barriers about uh, teachers not knowing how to teach about climate change with active pedagogies, with uh, social knowledge. So there is a great need for uh, for uh, teachers to get the knowledge. So that they can bring uh, to the students in, uh, in, that, uh, <laughs> in that circle. So, um, yeah, there was uh, on the next slide, I have a few. Yeah, 95% of teachers want to teach about climate change, for example, in class, but less than 30% know how to do it. So, this is also why Article 12 of the Paris Agreement emphasizes on that. And um, this is what we do at the Office for Climate Education. And uh, I also brought some uh, pedagogical resources that we produce for uh, teachers. Um, so you can also have a look out there. Um, so both producing pedagogical resources for teachers uh, on how to give the knowledge and the pedagogy for that, um, and how to teach uh, trainers and how to teach teachers to use those pedagogical resources. Because it's not only getting the, the, the right book, but it's also how you train teachers to actually uh, integrate in their pedagogy in classrooms to um, to to be efficient and to, for the knowledge to, to to be adaptive also. Because what we produce, so we produce in several language, languages, but we also have projects uh, internationally. We have one in Latin America, for example, and one which is uh, beginning to design in Africa. Because what we produce here needs to be adapted to every context. For example, if you talk about a case study on the, the mountains in France and how climate change affects mountains in France, it doesn't have any meaning for a student who is in the other parts of the world. So this is also how we understand climate change about contextualism uh, to every uh, context, to every uh, situation, to every community. This is uh, an important part of uh, what the OCE uh, is doing. So the first point is also about critical thinking because getting the knowledge is also to be able to reflect on uh, what uh, what is climate change, uh, what is the system of uh, climate change which is happening, and this is also what uh, does a new decoder with, uh, with that, and also what I found very interesting in the collaboration with the Young Reporters for the Environment, which is a program led by the Foundation for Environmental Education, which is an NGO. Um, based in Denmark, but it works internationally. And uh, basically, they have this program of engaging students to report on climate, to report on environmental issues with those four steps, which is to first investigate, research solution, report, and disseminate, uh, which is uh, basically a common methodology to develop critical thinking. And, um, and uh, also, they send a lot of their students to international conferences, to go to talk to stakeholders, to talk to uh, people, and uh, would it be at local level within communities, or would it, would it be also in the people who actually produce uh, the law? So it has been uh, young reporters for the environment are most of the time also challenging uh, the perspective, challenging uh, stakeholders that they meet. And uh, I think this is also a great uh, action to, to demonstrate. And the final point is actually to engage towards action. And this is what should be delivering. Yeah, this is the, the vision that. Uh, uh, young reporters for the environment uh, exhibited actually during COP26. Uh, if you want to have a look on the on the website, and engaging toward action is to create actually adaptation uh, uh, projects within communities to uh, give sense and appropriation to what they're doing, to what the students can learn at school, uh, in order to find their own solution. Um, because as we say, climate justice has different impacts locally. It's a global phenomenon with both the local impacts. And uh, yeah, there are lots of uh, projects happening. For example, uh, I, I have one in mind, which is in Mauritius. Uh, um, actually, uh, eco school students going uh, in the tourism field and uh, working with uh, um, entrepreneurs in, uh, in, in, the, in the sector of uh, tourism, try to see what are the solutions to adapt the tourism sector to the local consequences in terms of erosion, 
So this is um, actually giving context to what the student can learn in schools. And uh, with this final uh, sentence, and maybe uh, as we, we uh, talk about uh, environmental justice, is that maybe one objective that we can have is that no student should leave uh, school without environmentally or climate uh, educated. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm scribbling notes here furiously. I can't help but be drawn to that startling statistic that 0.03% of climate finance is spent on education when so often education is looked to as the key to approaching climate, the climate crisis and, and climate justice. Um, so I have to save our questions for, for the end here, um, but we're going to move a bit from these policy and, and educational interventions to Paul. Um, again, Paul uh, Spencer Sobicheski joining us up there on the screen um, and take a more philosophical slant and reflect a bit on how we got to this point. What is our relationship to nature? Um, raising some questions with no easy answers. Um, even as we explore solutions, we know those solutions don't, aren't necessarily easy either. Um, so Paul, you started working with the World Wildlife Fund in the early 1980s as head of creative services when awareness and action in the climate movement looked very different from today. Um, in fact, your recent memoir, A Conservation Notebook, highlights these decades of work you've had at the environmental front lines. And so I'm gonna turn this over to you to share with us your thoughts and your trajectory within the climate movement and what you see as the importance of, of this kind of storytelling in terms of marketing, really, you know, with your work with World Wildlife Fund, um, when it comes to achieving these environmental justice goals. Turn it over to Paul. Yes, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, is it possible for me to share my screen? Because I'd rather show my slides. The, the PDFs are getting... Uh, Okay. Cut off. We, we we are having some tech challenges, and that's not possible. Is it visible? Hopefully, from your side. Okay, I'll make do with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Well, listen, I've because uh, this mean I cannot change the slides myself. Okay, we can we can try. But Okay, um, we're gonna we're gonna try. Alice is gonna work here for just a minute um, to make that change. Okay, do you want to try it now, Paul? Sharing your screen. Yes. The adventures of Tyler. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> here we go. Fantastic. I prefer this. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Thank you. Now, friends, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the history of the conservation movement, put climate change in the context of a movement that's been going on for more than 50 years. And I'd like to ask you a question. The question, quite simply, is are you optimistic? Right now, we have, well, a lot of problems. We have climate change, loss of biodiversity, pollution, so on and so on. What's going on here? Are we optimistic or are we like lemmings? Are we leaping to our destruction but having a great ride on the way down? I joined WWF in the 19, early 1980s and conservation was not a big deal at that time. The people who hired me wanted me to focus on promoting the WWF brand. And this presentation is all about branding and positioning and marketing. I saw the job differently. I saw my job as putting conservation on the global agenda, mainstreaming conservation. And WWF expanded during that time. We started out with charismatic megavertebrates into protected areas, ecosystems, eventually into economics, environmental services, and treaties and lobbying. We had lots of conflict between the science of the projects and the emotions 
of the fundraisers. And then we expanded to business partnerships. And that's one reason that I left WWF because they took a policy that we could accept money from companies and influence their behavior at the same time. And I thought you either do one or the other. <laughs> Conservation now is a social movement, as we've just heard. All around the world, people are aware of climate change and other conservation issues. Now, I'd like to put conservation in the context of a global social movement. The world changes, so societies change. And some of the things that we could not have imagined 100, 150 years ago today are mainstreamed. For example, slavery internationally is considered wrong. I'm not saying the situation is perfect. It's not. But as a generally accepted principle, slavery is not on. R women's right to vote, child labor, the right to clean air and water, civil rights, free speech, and so on. These things show that society can and does change. So how do we get society to change in favor of nature conservation? Well, let's look at the scorecard and let's start off with conservation treaties. I ask, want to ask you a question. How many multilateral conservation treaties are there today? Who says 50? 100? 200? More than 1,300 multilateral treaties, of which COP is one. Some of them have been very successful. Many of them are well-intentioned, but there's no in enforcement mechanism. There's no policing. If a country does not adhere to what it says it's going to do, there's no direct punishment except public opinion and pressure. Look at the good things that we've accomplished. All countries have laws, protected areas, environmental bureaucracies. We have very good active NGOs. We have good people, education, technology, and I believe in technology. But we also have something that is not looked at very much. More than 100 countries have the rights of nature inscribed in their national constitution. That means that nature has a right to exist, a basic right, just like a basic human right to exist. More than 150 countries say that people have a right to a healthy environment. Think about that, that's big. And for me, the most, not the most interesting, but a very interesting aspect, in seven countries, juristic personhood has been granted to natural areas and features, including an orangutan like this. It could also be trees, it could be forests, it could be rivers. That means they have a legal right to exist and a legal right to protest against their destruction. Nevertheless, in spite of all these good things, we look at the newspaper every day, and my God, we're doomed, it's over, it's finished. We're gonna all die. So what's happening? Why is there this discrepancy between what we've achieved and what remains to be done. You all know the story of Sisyphus. He was condemned to push a boulder up the mountain. And just as he got near the top, the boulder would fall down and he'd start all over again. Well, if Sisyphus had to do a progress report, what would it look like? 
what would our conservation progress report look like? Let's talk about storytelling. If you're writing any kind of article, fiction or nonfiction, any kind of novel, any kind of movie, you want conflict. And conflict partly comes from good guys and bad guys, heroes and villains, victims and saviors. This is a concept that we should never forget in our communications. We have to be storytellers in order to get our message across and have impact. The big villain, of course, is money, isn't it? It's greed, ego and greed. Cause loss of human empathy and disregard for vital environmental systems. But, and there's always a but, the buts in writing are very important in communication. There's always another way to look at things. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. A lot of people are making money. A lot of people are better off than they have been. There's a, con there's a contradiction here that is, has to be recognized. What's happened in many cases is that the bad guys have become me and you. We've met the enemy and he is us. This is the classic Pogo cartoon. We have become the villains and we have, our, all our individual actions have been scrutinized as being bad. To the point that we take small actions to try to save the planet. Well, it's good that this woman is shopping with her own cotton tote bags. Is she saving the planet in a small way? Is she addressing the bigger issues? Probably not. Now, I run writing workshops. I work with writers. I wrote this book about writing. And there's three tips that you might consider in your own messaging. And they're not mutually exclusive. You need them all. One is you have a choice between a cold message, which is full of statistics, facts, information. We need that, but make it hot. Create intimacy with the reader. How do you do that? You need to look at the story of one, the story of this woman as representing thousands and thousands of nameless individuals who were at Woodstock in 1969. You need to look at a disaster, which happens to many, many people, versus a tragedy, which happens to one individual. I'm going to give you an example. Let me tell you a story. The headline, Child Labor in Palm Oil Industry Tied to Girl Scout Cookies, an article by Robin McDowell and Margie Mason. They wrote a series in the Associated Press, and they nailed it. They got these concepts right. Who do we have as characters? We have Olivia Chaffin. Olivia Chaffin is an 11-year-old Girl Scout from the American state of Tennessee. She is a well, very successful seller of Girl Scout cookies. One day she looked at the ingredients list of the Girl Scout cookies she was buying, she was selling, and she saw they were made with palm oil. And she said, no, that's wrong. Palm oils are destroying the rainforest. We've got to do something about it. She started a national movement that got the Girl Scouts of America to change their suppliers and the way the cookies are manufactured so they don't have palm oil. But you see where but comes in? The five key words, but nevertheless, in spite of, however. But there's another side of the story. And this is Ima. Ima is 10 years old. She lives in North Sumatra in Indonesia. Ima 
was in the fourth grade. She was very good at math. She wanted to be a doctor. She had to quit school to help her father in the oil palm plantation where she works 10 to 12 hours a day without protection, cutting her feet, cutting her hands, ingesting pesticides. And Olivia Chaffin found out about Ema. And she said, it's not right that I have everything this young girl in Sumatra doesn't. This is the kind of work that Ema does. Notice that she's not wearing shoes and she's in the middle of the day. You can imagine what the working conditions are like. Here's what Olivia said. I'm not just some little girl who can't do anything about this. Children can make change in the world and we're going to. Well, congratulations, that's great. We need more people like Olivia. She's the hope. They did not interview Ima directly, which I think is a mistake. She still works in the oil palm plantation. And I think, I hope she still wants to be a doctor. Okay, when I was with WWF, we got caught up in tragedies. We got ca caught up in disasters. You may remember the ozone hole that was going to destroy all the forests of Europe. The biodiversity crisis, the last tigers, the population bomb. And for marketing, for fundraising, this was very successful. It was not necessarily reflected in the projects that we were doing. There was a discrepancy there. So one of your key jobs in marketing is do people react better to a problem or do they react better to a solution? How do you balance out the two? The other thing you have to consider is that people have compassion fatigue. There are so many problems around the world that you go knocking on the door saying, I'm here to talk about climate change and I want your support. And that person may say, yes, it's very nice. You're a nice person, but I want a cure for cancer. I want better pay for teachers. I want better health care. They're tired. They're tired of problems. A little bit of philosophy, if you permit me. We come from nature. We have not always lived in harmony with nature, but we need nature. We are part of nature. We need nature. And one reason you see house plants in office buildings, not for biodiversity conservation, it's because it makes us feel better. We have a practical need for nature. We need clean water. We need clean air. We have an emotional need for nature. Yet in many societies around the world, we have a need to control, manage, and exploit nature. We even have a right to do it. Many of the societies say it's our obligation. It's our right. We can conquer nature. And in a way, we always conquer nature because we farm animals, we grow crops, we uh, engineer dams. We have great management of nature. So all is not peace and love in the world regarding nature. So we have a basic question. Is it respecting nature or is it rape? Okay, final questions for you. What is the best tactic? Do we scold people? Do we praise, incentivize, maybe saying you will make money or the national economy will benefit? Or do we wait for a hero? I see this as three themes and perhaps we need all three. The first one, promote a society concept where we love the earth, we feel we are part of the earth, we need the earth, we have an emotional connection to nature. 
we also can continue to do more of the same, but do it better. We can recycle. We can engage in treaties and lobbying, politics. We can work to support national parks and we can promote better a new technology, which, as I said, I have a bit of faith in. Or we can get angry. We can say revolutions take place. And this is a revolution. This social movement is a change in thinking. We can get angry and say, that's enough. We're finished. We need a change right now. Whether that happens economically, whether that happens politically, I want your comments on that. I don't have the answers. You have the answers. Now, like this Globe cartoon character, I don't know how the story ends. Uh, maybe you don't know either, but we're working towards the same goal. So stay optimistic. We'll figure something out and keep on fighting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm glad we had our tech issues resolved there. So there's some great visuals to, to illustrate these amazing points you're making here and providing um, these examples that situate us in history, but also allow us to take a, a step back and look at some of these bigger picture issues. And some of the examples you provided really illustrated the inequalities that Florian was discussing, you know, and the imbalance of power um, gives us something to, to connect the, the statistics and the politics. <coughs> with stories, with, with real life stories, as you're saying. Um, but on that theme of continuing the fight, um, we're going to shift to looking at um, climate action and activism taking place today with Marie Kouet. Um, so Marie, uh, you have been with Alternative of Paris since 2018. Um, you also studied environmental policy, worked on climate change um, issues in Central Asia, um, perhaps gain some of visibility for your action um, when you walk the Louis Vuitton runway at Paris Fashion Week in 2021, protesting overconsumption, um, where in the New York Times article you reported as saying, we march to demand that fashion realize that the world is burning. Um, so can you tell us more then about your work in your pursuit for environmental justice and your vision for transformation? Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm part of a movement that's called Alternative Paris, and um, we are a movement that is a citizen movement. So that means we believe that the changes that we need to face the environmental crisis right now are not going to come from the people at our power because they actually they hold their privileges from the very system that we are trying to change. So the hope resides in uh, citizens coming together. Um, and in managing to actually make the system uh, change. We also describe ourselves as radical, not uh, because we want to uh, appear as extremists. I think I uh, yelled a bit too much in the, <laughs> in the demonstrations lately, uh, so I apologize. Um, and uh, yeah, so we just describe ourselves as radical because we believe that uh, we have to go to the root uh, of uh, what causes the crisis, and not only care about what uh, uh, we'll talked about it already, but about the small gesture, about the small um, individual action that uh, we are encouraged to take. Um, and we are also pragmatic, so we are not fighting for the beauty of the ideas. Uh, we are really looking towards analyzing the situation and seeing where victories are possible and campaigning towards those victories, um, meaning. We, are not, we, we know that tomorrow Emmanuel Macron is not going to come out of the ABC and say, okay, I made it, I, I understood. We are not going towards the growth and, uh, because you, you asked it. Um, so we are picking our fights, and the goal is really to pick the fights that are allowing you to let go of your basis and you know, make more and more people go join, join the fight. Um, but because we look about environmental justice, I just wanted to provide a few facts. Um, which, which, uh, which is very simple, and I think it's something that we all know already, but uh, the people who are causing uh, the less the environmental crisis are also the people who are the most likely to suffer from it. Um, and uh, just a few numbers, maybe two, 
to, to just illustrate this. Uh, in France, the wealthiest 10% emits as much carbon as the 50% as the poorer half. Um, to just take an example, like Bernard Arnault, so the richest uh, man in France and in the world, I believe, um, has a wonderful view called Symphony. Um, and when he goes on holiday, uh, one month's holiday on Symphony, he's emitting as much carbon as 140 average French people per year so for one month of holiday. Um, and yeah, this is just to illustrate that, um, yeah, maybe less than that, it's from the Oxfam report. You have 63 millionaires in France uh, whose assets are emitting as much carbon as 50% of the French population. Um, so, so we, we all know that there is, that, that we have a different responsibility in the crisis, but sometimes we tend to remember the scale of it, like just, uh, just, just the scale of it. And then in terms of consequences, um, it, it's it's extremely similar. And uh, we already talked already about the, the intersectional perspective a little bit and how you're more susceptible to the vulnerable. But like this is very much illustrated by concrete examples. Just let me take two, one that is um, international, and that is um, the Pakistan flooding of this summer, because this summer um, it was actually the absolute record for population displacement ever. So 15 million people got displaced in Pakistan because of, of the massive flooding. The previous record, like the previous time uh, that as much people got displaced, it was in 2010, and it was 38 million people being displaced, but for all countries in the world. So the climate crisis is really speeding up, and it's actually affecting the people who are the least causing the climate crisis in Pakistan, people emit on average by a one ton carbon per person. Uh, when comparing to its friends, the friends is like nine ton of carbon. So that's an example. Another one, the more local one, is the consequences of the 2003 heat wave um, in Paris and in the Sahara. When you are comparing the mortality uh, rates, um, you actually see that there are very stable uh, point of percentage of difference between the mortality rates in the Sahara, such as Sensonli. Um, when you compare it to Paris Center. Um, and it's the same as uh, this COVID uh, uh, that we saw lately, like where the servers have actually been massively uh, more, yeah, that there has been massively more uh, debt um, in, in the servers because people, are, because, yeah, just you don't have access to the same healthcare, you also work harder, any jobs that are less protective, uh, and so on, and so on. And um, the picture that I put on the slide here is um, a common action that we took with an organization called Pobremer in Bagnolet. Um, and they're just campaigning a lot on the fact that um, their territory, their, the, the place they live in, um, is, really, is really hard. It, it's really hard to breathe in those places. Um, and, um, and actually, they campaign there because there is quite a lot of project in Paris with like bicycle lane and like free planting. But this is advertised as like the new green project, the new the Grand Paris. Um, but actually why Paris is like getting better and more livable, uh, the suburb is not getting better. So hi. <laughs> um, so yeah and then so once you see the causes and the consequences, you, I think now everyone, um, pretty much everyone in the political world agrees uh, that there is an environmental crisis, which was not the case, I'd say, even 10 years ago. Um, but then you have the different approaches. Uh, and the approach that we see the most in France and in many other developments in the world is to say, yeah, listen, kids, Robots are going to take care of this. Uh, you don't have to worry. We are going to implement new innovations, new technology. Billionaires are going to help us because they are super innovative. Um, and uh, we are going to make some green nitrogen here, install some nuclear power plants there, um, some uh, pollution filters, and, uh, and it's all going to be all right. Um, the way and then to the government when you talk to them, um, they justify a lot the fact that they can't go faster with the political action because popular classes in France wouldn't want it. And they use a lot of the phrases of the yellow vest 
who second us the kind of commitments in the way. We try to go quick, we try to implement the power of tax, but like look at the people who want it and the people are actually um, on the verge of destroying the country. So we have to go slow and we have to make progress slowly, we have to make people use of this. Um, and actually, a lot of the people in the kind of movements, when the Yellow Vest movement started, had this kind of like, I'd say, and then my movement um, had this really huge skepticism uh, and even despise to say, hey, who are these people? Actually, they are campaigning for the gas to cost less. They didn't understand the crisis that we're in. They are like, campaign, they, they don't guess that actually the gas is going to have to be. Uh, more expensive because this is one of the ways that we have to consume less gas. So there was a lot of those tools. But actually, um, after I'd say about a month of movement and then after exchanging uh, a lot between representatives of the social movement and between the uh, uh, United movement, uh, alliances began to quickly form because you actually see really quickly um, this important thing that was also on the front of all demonstrations at the end of the month and uh, the end of the of the world thought itself in the same way. Um, in France, uh, the report of health of the population um, is emitting on average five tons of carbon per year. Um, the richest in person that was talking about earlier is emitting 25 tons of carbon per year. So when you are asking airports and when you are talking to people, they think that we are not going to make an universal carbon tax that is going to affect everyone, uh, including the people who are depending on their cars to go to work. Um, there is no, I mean, there is nothing to be astonished about when uh, this doesn't work as a political solution. And um, and I think it illustrates really good uh, that there is absolutely a way to solve the environmental crisis without social justice and also that type of social justice. So once you have this context, um, there is this whole reflection that's going on kind of movement on what our role is right now. Because we did a lot since 2018, there were there was quite a bit of renewal of the of the of the of the matter was like Friday for future completely going up in the news uh, with youth movements really intensifying and massifying around the world. But beyond this massification and education, um, it's been five years now. And there is a lot of like feelings I'd say from activists that hey, not everyone acknowledges the issue, but um, how do we build further? How do we get bigger? How do we yeah, what, what's the way forward? And so, so the way we see it is um, as one of the stakeholders of this movement, and uh, everyone has a different role in this. But it's really to connect the environment with uh, our lives um, and to really campaign to say that environment is about, it's about actually everything. It's about the way we work, it's about uh, the air we breathe, it's about the food we eat, it's about our clothes, it's about everything. Um, and in the midst of this, so we began, but there is this tool of like the, the kind of movement has to get bigger and it also has to be more inclusive because it's too wide, it's too, um, it's too much of an educated class, it's too much of a, uh, we, we have to be inclusive. But actually, the way we see it is not that we have to be inclusive uh, because we, we, we are not there to include people in a patronizing way by saying we do have to come to our projects. Um, and then maybe we'll make some anti racism on the side. We have to co construct with other movements. We have to, to build together uh, a new political project. And I just want to give a few illustrations of this. Um, this is a campaign that we did um, against Amazon in France uh, because we targeted my um, um, what I miss the word in English, um, a, yeah, a temporary. Um, stop of the building of new warehouses at Amazon. And actually, this was very much at the beginning. This, uh, the, it was very much true. So, yeah, okay, you are against jobs. Like, Amazon is providing jobs for people, especially in poor neighborhoods and um, places in France where there is no factory, that there is nothing left for people to work in. So, you are blaming against this. 
So we really needed to, when building this site, connect this work unit, to connect with um, actually also small business owners who are, whose job are being destroyed by Amazon, um, and, to, and to build these alliances, not only being like, yeah, you know, Amazon is like super polluting uh, and uh, the kind of thing that has to be taken care of, it, but to really build together the political and the, the plan that we had um, uh, for this. Um, I think there is one slide missing, but um, I'll talk about it quickly. There, there was um, one uh, one action that I wanted to talk about that was an alliance that we did two years ago with uh, refiners from Corpri. So Corpri is a, is a refinery um, in St. Lawrence in the south of Paris, in the suburb. Um, and um, actually, oil sector workers and factory workers were pushed out by Total. Was saying actually um, for ecological reasons we are going to close uh, the the refinery and we are going to make green hydrogen instead. And the workers uh, were going to lose their jobs. So of course they um, campaigned through work unions through strike um, against this. And I remember uh, Adam Mohamed, who was one of the leader of this fight, coming to uh, the the train of march. And everyone being super puzzled about this, seeing like the total uh, um, outfit uh, of this person coming on stage. And he made this speech that was absolutely mind blowing for everyone, uh, saying, Hey, do you think we like working for Brutal? Like we are in Senegal, this is one of the only job providers here. And no total is wanting to hire us because they are saying that they are this ecological project and that they are going to make some greener stuff um, instead of working in business. But actually, uh, Total is investing billions um, in projects such as ECOP in Africa, in Tanzania, in Uganda. They were just, this was not so profitable at work to, to, to do the, the oil working or kind of defense. So they just wanted to close about that. And they used all this psychological uh, narrative. And this is where it was interesting for us, for the kind of movement to come and do an alliance with them to just reveal this uh, little speech of the time and to analyze it together and then to try and build together uh, an alternative plan. So we began working together. Uh, the friend of us really led this thing. Um, and they got on the table with uh, the work unions and with the worker and said, okay, what are your skills? and what is the how, how like how would you transform the factory and the skill that you got um, if you had free net? So people uh, in your sector, not surprisingly, were perfectly able to to actually make a plan uh, to create uh, to to create new, new a new way to work and to to just transition, but just the yeah the control I think that to. To implement it, but it was really interesting to work on this plan together. And this is a, a fact that's so going on. And yeah, I'll finish with this. Um, that was uh, so this is uh, whose mother uh, was murdered uh, by police and friends um, a few years ago uh, on a case that was uh, that was very much like the one of George Roy. And um, there also was some. So at the beginning, some people were saying, hey, we need to include the anti-racist movement. And I think this is really the illustration of what we don't want to include, but co-construct. Um, it's not about the climate movement becoming this like overarching fight that everyone has to join. It's really about the climate movement recognizing that um, there are other priorities and that we need to work uh, for a common political project that's including uh, both of those priorities. And what we came out with when we worked together was this, uh, you, you talked about it already, already but uh, the, the word we want to breathe, um, that was really a common motto for the kind of movement and for the anti-racist and anti-police violence movement. Uh, because it was those, uh, actually one of the words in the movement was saying, hey, you know, I don't want that kid to die because a policeman uh, killed them, but I also don't want them to die because they are pushing this policy here because they live in in poor neighborhoods and it's like um it's a graceful problem. So it was really yeah it was really like one of the 
whatever the most interesting um, part of the last two years. Uh, and I just had two, yeah, the last slide I'm going to, I will get on. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, thanks on the Thank you, uh, gosh, I mean, I'm I'm brimming with questions. You've just heard from three phenomenal speakers working, coming at climate and environmental justice from, from all different angles, um, um, touching on inclusivity, diversity of the movement, storytelling, and whose stories get told. Um, I have three pages of questions, but in the interest of time and, and uh, making this interactive, we're just gonna jump straight to opening the floor for questions, because um, we really do wanna take the time while we're all in the room here together in person and virtually to have a conversation. Um, I'm sure our, our speakers raise lots of questions, so we'll turn it over to the audience for Q&A. We have a big final round of applause for everyone who's straight passing. Yes, and so whether you are on Zoom, if you can hear me okay, I'm sitting here. Hello, Zoom audience. Um, we are opening up the question section of the evening. So, in person questions first, are there any in person questions? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, I see that the focus of all three of your speakers is on education, which I think is absolutely important, but I'm wondering why at your age there's not more political involvement, because it does still seem to me that we can that change more quickly, excuse me, more significantly, to change the political makeup of, you know, the uh, in France or legislature, excuse me, in the United States or Congress, and yet I don't see younger people involved that way. So is it because there's disillusionment? Do you think that education is more effective than direct political action? Why don't you focus more in trying to get the people you want to vote for um, climate change legislation to get into office? Um, well, the question is difficult about political power, education, and how education should deliver also political power. And I think this is a tricky question also about how you implement climate change education policies. There are lots of barriers of actually putting climate change in the curriculum. Some uh, politicians would say, yeah, uh, we're not going to put the climate change in the curriculum because we're going to be a generation of activists and we don't want to have activists. This is one barrier because uh, yeah, politicians think that, of course, we're going to, to, to create, uh, yeah, so this is one there is also how do you talk about climate change in the curricula? It needs to be transdisciplinary. Uh, we think that curricula are already overloaded by math, by uh, science, by uh, other things. So one point I think is how you integrate climate change in the curriculum is uh, a really complex subject uh, right now. Um, but still, I think uh, climate education should deliver political power. But also, when you think about this generation, if it's still difficult, what about the politician in place? Uh, did they benefit from this type of climate education? So it's also building the next people we be forward and how um, how climate, as I said, like no generation should leave school without being climate literate. So I think it's a long process. We're getting into the generation, and we've waited too much for that. <laughs> think about including climate change, including uh, environmental. I think both of us, both of us, for example, we might have had like two or three classes for environment in schools, but we also had all those spaces to express. And this is also what school should deliver. And I think we talked about that third space also, how schools. What's happening in school? What happened with schools and communities? Schools at the center of communities. As how do you exchange with, uh, for example, uh, association of women who are suffering the consequences of climate change? Um, so it's all about building alliances, and how school can also build alliances for that because it's not yet in the politics. <laughs> mm, I'd say. It's, it's also a matter of like where you stand and what your role in the movement is. I think that your, the role of the organization is to keep doing this education work that's absolutely necessary. Um, 
I'd say for my organization, like for um, for some of the organization of the kind of movements, uh, the, the, the thing that we have is that we need to move from education because a lot of politicians and I think are using education as an excuse to delay action by saying, hey, as long as um, like keep educating the else, and actually they are educated, they know they know about the issues, they know about the, the, the stakes are very clear in their head. Um, so we are targeting political measures, like we are trying to pass bills, we campaigned during the climate um, law, but today the balance of power is not good because like um, it's an absolute struggle to get any little measure um, pass uh, uh, with the current government, but like uh, it, it's really it's really hard to see away because advocacy doesn't work. Like um, the experience that I got from the Amazon campaign is like going and seeing like 300 MPs all of them signing and being in favor of the thing, and then Emmanuel Macron um, having lunch with Jeff Bezos and saying, "Hey, no, my party is not going to vote this. Uh, go away." Social movements are really hard to make work because. The government once again doesn't care if uh, we see trying to millions of people take over the streets. Um, and direct action works more or less uh, sometimes, but it's, it's it's quite hard as well. So I think it's it's about keep um, keep waiting and keep um, building this balance of power until we reach a critical mass and until we actually manage um, changing stuff. I think it's also very much connected to the nature of the Peace Republic, where um, constitutionally the president can decide everything, and the president that we have now is not a kind of fundamentalist. And uh, the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, there is some people in the last election from the kind of movement who actually ran for election, ran for election, and who got elected in the office. I think that I might be fooled about, um, uh, yeah, about a few other. Uh, but it's extremely hard when you come from the climate movement uh, or from any other movement where people actually support each other um, and care for each other to go into this field of like the, this political game uh, where it's all about intriguing and um, and it's a power play. Um, and a lot of us are not good to do this and are not willing to do this. Um, and I think we should, because uh, there is really a lot of, uh, it's a way to, to pass decisions way more than uh, structuring yourself um, as a citizen or supplementary, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy. I think it's one of the barriers. Thank you. Let's see if uh, Paul, would you like to respond? We have another question with you, otherwise. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Because because your sound on your side is not very clear. Okay, um, if, we're, if we're talking about politics, I recall the, when Bill Clinton was running for president, he was talking about international affairs, the Bosnia war, and his advisors said, no, 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 no. It's the economy. And I think most politicians have a short shelf life. They have a half life of maybe two, three, four years. They have voters who they have to please. And voters primarily are interested in local issues. And if you talk to a, a voter in, let's say, a developed European country about a country in the middle of the Pacific that's about to go, to, about to disappear because of climate change, people will say, that's, that's too bad, but I can't get an appointment with a doctor because the healthcare system is broken. There are different priorities, and I think Politi politicians are short-sighted. They don't take a, 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 the long-term view and they want solutions. They want things that they can do easily and 
which they can then show to people say I did this so it's it's nice to say we must have 1.5 degrees maximum warming and limited to that it might also be interesting and maybe effective to say here's two things you as a politician specifically can do that will help this global problem, but also make our lives here in your constituency better. Great, thank you. We have two questions in the room. Thank you, and thanks so much to uh, Florian, Paul, and Marie for the presentations. And like, like you, I have a gazillion questions. But first, a couple of quick reactions to your question. I reckon you should reduce the, vote, the voting age to 16. I reckon that would engage youth a lot more and change the balance out there. Uh, but my, my question I have for you is, all three of you lined up agendas, lined up different justice agendas. And I think, from my experience, the economic justice is inextricably linked with environmental justice. The people who are adversely affected by water pollution, air pollution, uh, poor public transport, so on, all tend to be in the lowest socioeconomic parts of society, in the areas around factories, around train stations, or, you know, that, that, that suffer both economically and environmentally. So linking those agendas, I think, is going to be key. Um, so I don't know if any of you would like to expand on that a little more. And maybe I can try speaking on that about how I mean, yeah, economic is also at the center of gender inequality. And I think I can take only the, the eco feminist movement in Latin America um, about how big economic companies come to the land of the native people. Native people are excluded from, uh, for example, finance. They do not have a, a finance bank, bank account. So they are dependent on the companies that arrive to work. Um, and to exploit the soil, this exploitation then leads to uh, more um, sexual aggressions towards women. That leads also to destruction of nature. Uh, that leads to uh, the destruction of economical resources to women. As I showed, like 80% of women in Africa are economically dependent on natural resources. So I think economy uh, is a, also a key factor that is linked to, uh, uh, to the, the several vulnerabilities. But in the end, it's also how uh, we use resources uh, due to climate etc. to also adapt, adapting to climate change as a cost also, a cost that is still less than uh, just suffering the consequences of climate change. But adapting, for example, changing your model of agriculture has a cost, and uh, it's also where we put uh, climate finance and uh, in terms of so also uh, international inequalities. <laughs> Um, no, I, I agree that this is absolutely mm -hmm. uh, the core of the problem. Um, I don't know, like instead of like going into that takes me too much. I think an example that I can take is the pension reform right now, and like the the bridges that we are trying to build um, with the climate movement, because it's it's I think it's very symbolic of the way that um, we treat um, the crisis. Like there is this common. Think of the government saying, okay, the economy is not going to work anymore. It's not going to be able to sustain as much people. So we need to work longer. We need to blah, blah, blah. And actually, when you analyze it um, with the, the, the environmental crisis in mind, yeah, you should absolutely have a production question in mind and like wonder, okay, so we are going to work longer, but like to produce what? Um, to, yeah, like what way is this necessary? Actually, there have been a lot of progress in technology over the last uh, 100 years. Um, a lot of jobs have become automatic. Uh, a, a lot of, and, and like, so I remember reading like this uh, debate from the 50s where people were like, hey, how are robots going to make us uh, not work anymore? Um, say, yeah so, yeah, so now we are trapped in like those uh, first person bullshit jobs. Um, and, we are told that we need to work until 62 uh, because it's like the way it's, it has to be. And it's it's really crazy that we 
it's harder. I think there is a saying like uh, in the climate and the in the social movement, but it's harder to um it's actually hard, easier for people to envision um the end of our world rather than the end of our economic system and transformation into something new. So yeah, I think that's the connection there. Another in-person question. Hello there. I'd just like to say thank you to the speakers first. I have uh, just a comment and then a question on the uh, comment or an observation. I, I think uh, Paul mentioned the, the population problem with Ehrlich, and I think that this is important in our messaging as well when we think about potentially top-down messaging, uh, that we really need to make sure that we're also providing agency for people to make their choices. So I think in that particular example that uh, there were some you know, really terrible things that came afterwards in terms of forced sterilization in parts of uh, the subcontinent of India, and that uh, we really need to make sure that we're also providing agency for people as well. Uh, and so the, uh, I, th I think the point there is just that, you know, doomsday messaging can be uh, coupled with top-down action can be uh, a negative thing. And the second is a question. I, I come from the materials side, so I'm interested in circular economy. Uh, there's an upcoming event around the United Nations Environment Assembly where there'll be negotiations around a plastics treaty. Now, I'd be curious to hear folks, uh, their opinion about what injustice would look like in terms of plastics treaty. Um, yeah, I'm not a super big specialist of this, uh, but I know that it's on. Areas, the experience that we have when we negotiated or when we worked on some bills uh, in the kind of law, sometimes circular economy was used um, as a I don't know, as a buzzword and as a as a it's a bit like I don't know um, sustainable development. It's like those was was so much used that they lose the original sense um, and that you don't really know what they mean anymore. Um, and there is also this whole um, way of the industry of saying. I mean, like, up announcing this whole, yeah, we are great because we are going to reduce the use of virgin plastic by 50 persons in like 10 years. But, like, if you're going from like, I don't know, a thousand ton uh, of plastic uh, per blah, 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 per year, it's still going to be huge. So, it's like, and then people want to make you believe that uh, actually circular economy doesn't work in them because the, the law of thermodynamics tells you that there is always some plus in the process, so you can never really reuse the same thing um, completely. There is always going to be some loss. There is always going to be some waste in the process. Um, so yeah, I'd say you just have to be careful that uh, when, yeah, when those words are used, uh, that this is actually the better, the, the only plastic that is good is the plastic that is not produced, a bit like fossil fuels. And that this is really heading towards this objective and that's serving as a as a hiding spot for uh, producing recycled plastic. Um, maybe just a comment also that I have to link with the young reporters for the environmental work. During COVID-19, a lot of students decided to actually write on the issue of plastic because we went outside to um, have delivery and everything. So, there are lots of interesting stories that you can find on the uh, website. Um, the only thing, I think the only thing that I wanted to add also about uh, climate environmental justice links to plastic is also where you put the companies where you recycle plastics. And there are lots of uh, recommended readings about that in terms of the off group. Uh, Lucie Lorient and Richard from the book. We actually try to um, uh, to to study the space of where those types of companies are located on the territory, mostly in suburbs, uh, mostly in people who are actually suffering already the consequences. People in suburbs they breathe sixty six percent more polluted air than people in the center of Paris, for example. Also, uh, leading to racial discrimination about. Um, um, I don't know what to say, um, Jean Voyage, um, people, um, I don't know how to say it in English, uh, people who are uh, nomad people uh, in France, they are also more likely to live in, uh, uh, because uh, the municipality, they place those type uh, of, of people next to those types of companies. So it's also linked to, I think this is the things that I wanted to make with the environmental justice question.
Uh, Paul, maybe you would like to respond to the comment about doomsday messaging and top-down change? You're talking to me. Yes, hello. <laughs> yes, hi. Could you just repeat the question, you please? Want, I'm not hearing you very well. Uh, yeah, let's see. I was just curious. Uh, you wanted to make a comment that uh, I think in your presentation you brought up uh, Paul Ehrlich, uh, Ehrlich with the population bomb. It's my understanding that after the publication of this book, there had been uh, how to put um, some movements or some uh, ideas to put this into practice. That this is. Uh, I mean, my understanding of it is that there have been people who are against immigration who have used this mm -hmm. work as a as inspiration, another side of this was uh, forced sterilizations in India. And my, my comment was to say that I think that you can be more successful with having agency uh, for the people. So if you if you wanted to bring down population size, it's better to empower women than to do a top-down policy from above, was my, my observation. That's a huge question. <laughs> um, you know, people have been worried about population for a long time. And for, somehow, the world keeps functioning uh, in spite of climate change, in spite of population, in spite of inequalities. I'm not saying it's the best of all worlds, but the world keeps on on functioning and population risks being rather, um, how shall we say it? It's not a popular thing to talk about now, but it's, it, it can be rather colonial in the sense that uh, uh, we in Western Europe have negative population growth and other countries have considerably positive population growth. And that's leading to a migration crisis. And that migration crisis is exacerbated by things like climate change, by water wars, environmental conflicts, by political instability, by the lack of democracy, the lack of trust in leaders. And it's all linked. So. I think the world leaders are, are very aware of this, but again, I go back to the point that it needs to be brought back to the national local level in order to get people to, to re, in, in order to get politicians, decision makers to really act. If the problem is too big, then everybody will say, well, yeah, it's too bad, but nothing we can do about it. I'm, uh, I believe in keeping things uh, in, let's say, look at the big picture. Well, you know that old slogan, act, um, what is it? Look globally, act locally. Uh, consider the big picture, but don't forget that you have to take action and specific actions have to be taken at the local level. Um, that's all. Thank you. Speaking of migration, <laughs> um, thank you so much for all of your interventions. They're all very interesting. Um, my question is more of a personal one, I suppose. How do all of you position yourselves on the question of um, the actions that we should be taking ourselves individually in comparison to, well, in this, in keeping in mind the fact that on an individual level for the average person, our impact is not so large when we compare ourselves to corporations. Um, how, I guess, guilty should we be feeling? You know, if we buy a new piece of clothing, how, how much of the responsibility is for us as individuals to bear and how you kind of navigate that, that those, those sentiments? Um, I, I hope I won't disappoint you, but I, still do not have the answer and I think this is also a generational because uh, yeah I think I also come from a generation where we're still um, uh, we're still do not know if we're doing enough if it's okay and even if you accumulate what individuals can do maybe only 20% of the population can do this 
So there is more responsibility, but also responsibility at the individual level creates a lot of eco anxiety. And I think this is also a key challenge in our generation. Um, as a young people, as youth, and I think it needs to be addressed also uh, by politicians. How do you treat about eco anxiety? Um, thinking about responsibility can be really damaging for your mental health. Uh, and I think this is also how education should uh, also uh, try to, to treat that issue. About how you are informed about climate change, how do you lead towards actions, knowing that maybe your actions won't be enough, uh, but still uh, turning it into positive uh, actions and positive mental health. I think this is a key uh, element. And uh, working on eco anxiety is only happening now. It has not been uh, defined before. I think uh, um, also the um, um, uh, school system should address this question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Spider Man was a good answer for this. Like, uh, you have a great power, you have a great responsibility. So yeah, I think uh, to, to just develop a little bit on this, um, I think there is no reason to oppose the, the individual changes that you're ready to make and the uh, and the political uh, actions, systemic actions, because when you are doing things yourself, you're also experimenting uh, the world that you and you're also trying to find some joy in the world that is to come if we would like to I don't know, live in a, in a desirable world. Um, the most efficient actions to do. Uh, as an individual are to stop lying, uh, to change your bank account to a bank that is uh, more sustainable because most banks are actually investing your money in fossil fuel projects. Uh, so it's really interesting to look into that and to reduce or uh, stop it in it. Uh, but um, yeah, and I think it's, it's really, if I take the question personally, like, so I, I traveled uh, quite a lot also because I began my career work in, in Central Asia. And um, and then when realizing and politicizing, um, I stopped flying. I stopped, um, but but now I'm trying to. So it's, it's really interesting to experience this as a, not a sacrifice, but as a new way to invent stuff. So it's really like how would I travel now? Um, even if I want to travel far, like how would I do that? Um, how do I cook um, in some ways that are making me happy? Uh, with uh, the traditional meaty dishes of my grandma, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, this is all experience on your personal level. But I think the system that we live in is a totalitarian system. Like, there is no way to be perfect. And if you're trying to be perfect and live um, in a mind mentally uh, ideal manner, you are going either to make yourself completely depressed or you are going to retire yourself from society and go in an eco village somewhere uh, that is. The model that's not working for the whole population. So your responsibilities are, um, and, and I mean, I think it's it's also, and I agree with you, um, to, to be less anxious and to feel like you're trying to relax, it's also way more efficient to be in a group and to target political um, leaders or corporations that are actually having those, um, yeah, that are making the choices actually. Um, instead of uh, making yourself feel guilty the whole time. Paul, would you like to add? How do you feel about your individual responsibility to the climate justice movement, climate crisis? Yeah. Yeah, I think we all have a responsibility to be good eco-citizens. We have a responsibility to do what we can. We have responsibility and obligation to learn what the facts are and not be uh, uh, conned by uh, fake news. We have an obligation to push uh, our own politicians when, if we are lucky enough to live in a democracy to uh, enact uh, actions that are for the greater good. Um, let me give you an example of how this can be seen as a diversion though. You may recall a few years ago, what I called the great plastic straw diversion. And 
a group of uh, activists, I think they were in Seattle, they said plastic straws are polluting the ocean, killing marine life, and we have to get rid of plastic straws. And this became a great movement. And the businesses involved in selling and making plastics, in selling plastic straws like McDonald's and Burger King and so on, they jumped on it. This was something that they could do that was easy. And they said, we're good guys. We're, we're a green company because we don't give you a plastic straw anymore. In a way, it was a lot of nonsense because do you have an idea of what percentage of the ocean's plastic waste comes from plastic straws? Well, I'd ask for a show of hands if I was there with you. 5%, 10%, 2%. It's 0.025% of the plastic waste in the ocean is plastic straws. Nevertheless, companies jumped on the bandwagon and individuals felt really good about not using plastic straws. And it's a good thing. And one of the side effects that was good, so the individual action had a small but almost negligible effect on ocean pollution. But one of the good results was that this helped push, this gave the impetus to an international treaty on plastic waste. And that treaty is being negotiated now, I believe. And uh, that's a good thing. So a little bit of action can go a long way.